Hi everyone. Yeah, so I'm just uh, trying to to test this uh primitive little setup here because uh the Facebook screen sharing is a very very laggy process. And since I didn't want to take it on Zoom, I'm just uh trying to to see if I can if I can uh give a little presentation, you know, in this very primitive primitive way. Right, that's because the 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 lag on the the, the lag on this uh Facebook uh screen sharing is making it hard hard to present, right? So I, I would assume that um I would assume that this um uh presentation itself, right, would be saved on Facebook, right? So can everybody hear me? You know, is it is it like um clear enough for you to hear what I'm saying? someone type something to oh it sounds good okay yeah that's great so so i'm just going to give you know this uh lecture here i mean i don't call it a lecture because uh when i gave this uh, uh presentation i think that was like a uh, quite many years ago so i'm not too sure um i'm not too sure whether it's fully up to date you know because i've not been engaging in much of any of these um uh, teapot related teachings anymore so I'm just gonna give you a kind of like a fundamental overview of um of uh easing tahu or easing teapots so that you can actually uh really uh have a quick you know understanding on how to actually enter this uh, very uh deep and mysterious uh collection view right yeah I think this is uh not my first Facebook live uh video I mean uh I I used to do Facebook live videos like three or four a.m. you know in in some other groups. But uh, this is my first uh, public, public uh, uh, Facebook live uh, lecture for, for free. You no know, knowledge is meant to be shared, right? So uh, so today's uh presentation or lecture, I hope to finish it within an hour. You know, I did it in two hours the last time, right? But I think uh, um, because the last time I gave it in Chinese, so in as if if you are speaking Chinese, right, you tend to speak a lot faster, so um. I I will try to you know do it at a at a good pace in English yeah so so okay let's start you know this is the typical um I would say an overview of Yixing uh cha hu or Yixing teapots right so um you know when I gave the lecture on uh Yixing teapots itself right I always say that Yixing teapots is uh complicated you know I will use the four Chinese words here wu chong shuo qi that means that you know I really do not know where to start. Or, or 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 when to start, you know, it's it's such a broad topic, right? So um, I I I even say you know it is actually not uh I I am not the right person to give you a full lecture on Yixing teapots, that's because you know there are generations and generations of collectors and you know artisans and all that in the past generations, you know, so many of them, but the only funny thing is that um information on Yixing teapots has always uh been quite elusive. Right, so uh, when it's that elusive itself, right, you know, um, no nobody really wants to 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 give or share the information easily. So um, in order to learn about Yixing teapots itself, I, I mean, I show my gratitude to to all these uh great, great uh teachers of mine. You know, like say Chinese tea of Singapore, right? Um, uh, Mister Rick Chua, who is uh, uh taught me a lot about tea and uh teapots. A lot of Singaporean collectors. Especially uh Taiwanese uh collectors um and of course the author of the Zhao Qi Hu Si Dian uh Liu Lao Shi, right so he 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 taught 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 me a lot uh I even brought uh students from Singapore to Taiwan Taipei to have a class at uh Tang Ren Cha Yi so Tang Ren Cha Yi here this is actually uh in Taipei near Jian Guo Lu so this uh Tang Ren Cha Yi itself um uh Huang Jianlang Lao Shi is actually one of the best uh Zhi Sha Lao Shi in the world. That's because uh he typically uh is involved in some of the curating of the Zusha collection of the National Palace Museum, and he takes his uh, research very scientifically and very um I would say, uh objectively yeah so so um uh, this is uh, I would say uh, a a great place to learn about uh teapots and stuff like that and of course the late uh Xiao Hu Lao Shi right he passed away a few years ago right he was the one who 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 taught me a lot about the secrets and intricacies of uh looking at you know, uh, teapots and how to authenticate them to the era, right? And of course, uh, Peng Hu, that's a famous uh, Wu Lao Shi, right? This guy, uh, you learn from him by buying his teapots, 
not cheap, but guaranteed every item is real. So I think um, there are a lot of other friends like, you know, uh, my Taiwan procurement, Hua Yin, you know, and of course, uh, the rest of the other friends who also have been um, um, instrumental in, 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 I would say, uh, <coughs> uh, kind of like a teaching me uh, all about pots that I could put all this information together and to have it shared for, 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 for nothing, you know, for, so that everybody can benefit from this knowledge. Yeah. So I think the most important thing about uh, teapots, you know, if you say you want to collect teapots or if you want to, to uh, appreciate teapots itself is that uh, you should always um, approach teapots by, by looking for what we call 年代特征, which means that you want to have the marks of an era. So if uh, it, a material or something is made in a certain period of time, certain era, it should carry certain characteristics of, of that particular era, you know, sentiments, you know, materials, workmanship, right? These will all be reflected in in, 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 in a collectible, in a teapot. Yeah. So um, I always say that if you really want to enjoy uh, Ishing teapots or collection of teapots, whether you're going to go for factory one or you want to go for earlier ROC or Qing Dynasty teapots, it's all about um, how to appreciate uh, the the item itself, the collection itself, which means that um, if you can see the teapot as a mirror, that it reflects certain uh, aspects of a certain period of time, a certain uh, era, then you actually have a different level of appreciation for what you are collecting. Right, and uh, while we are collecting uh, teapots also, we must not forget that uh, in the Tang Dynasty, the Song Dynasty and the Ming Dynasty, the way that tea was being uh, made or enjoyed was very different. So um, uh, these uh, historical you know, differences in different dynasties itself have a role to play in how uh, vessels are being shaped. Right. So I like to propose uh, just a simple two-axis uh, view to looking at Susahu or Yixing uh, uh, teapot. So I would say that you have to look at one axis, which is um, the, the age, the era, all the way from uh, early... Uh, early early times or early days itself all the way to modern time and at the same time the second axis we have to always consider is a uh, the way tea is being enjoyed the material the workmanship and the way the pots are being fired so uh having these two um axes itself uh you would um uh, i would say have a certain degree of appreciation into uh uh i mean collecting Right, there are many, many more axes, you know. When, when you go to Taiwan circles, if you go to uh, a different um, uh, uh, collecting circles itself, right, you find that uh, the axes, there's so many, so many. Right, so we are just talking about the real basic. So I think the basic, we should have at least two, two, two axes, which will be kind of like a repetitive theme throughout the, um, uh, the, the whole um, uh, lecture here. That means that uh, you will see what I mean by uh, an era and of course what are the characteristics of a certain era. Okay. Right, so if you were to um, take a simple history, right? I mean, as of all subjects, the easiest way is to always uh, ground yourself in the deepest, uh, uh, earliest points in history, right? Is that uh, the Chinese like to, to, to dig, you know, and dig back uh, records and stuff like that. And they say that, you know, uh, Yixing wares were you know, dated back to 500, uh, 5,000 to 3,000 BC, you know, by having uh, shown evidences of uh, Yixing clay materials being made into um, um, vessels. So these vessels itself um, are probably used to store water, maybe to hold food or wine or something. So these are all from archaeological records. But uh, as what we would say, right, um, the, the Yixing west of these super early archaeological times itself um, they have no, um, I would say, no real Yixin culture into, into it. It's just being treated as a pottery clay that is being used to make uh, household items that they need. Right? So, uh, of course, the, 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 the Chinese uh, side would be very proud of um, having um, uh, tea wares, you know, or uh, Yixin dated back to so long ago. But uh, in principle, I think for us, we are more interested in when did Yixin actually uh, make its way into um, tea culture or somewhat related to that. So um, one other theme that, or one other topic that we have to um, uh, be aware of, right, is that um, there were not so many teapots, you know, in, in the very early eras, right? That means that if you go to the uh, Han Dynasty, you know, the Tang Dynasty and all that itself, you wouldn't really have a concept of teapot. That's because in the Tang Dynasty, most people would um, be, uh, I would say, cooking, 
cooking tea. So tea in Dui Cha Jing itself is more like, you know, being a soup, right, where they actually uh, uh, cook or, or prepare, you know, a, a, a soup, you know, a drink out of uh, cooking the tea leaves. So um, the notion of uh, brewing tea itself in the Tang Dynasty was not existent. So you would, you would not really see uh, very much uh, Tang Dynasty teapots, you know, of any, a, a, any sort because there is no such process. Right, so um, we say Tang Dai is Du Cha, which means that uh, Tang Dynasty, we cook tea, right? And uh, if you move to the Song Dynasty itself, right, uh, you, you would uh, see that it has evolved itself into a more um, elegant cultural process, right? They call it Dian Cha which means that they will grind uh, the, fine, the tea leaves into a fine powder and whisk it like you see today in the matcha, Japanese uh, matcha uh, whisking. So the Tian Cha Fa is um, uh, somewhat born in the Song Dynasty and it actually um, moved, moved or, or, or got transmitted to Japan where it was very, very well preserved, right? So uh, in Song Dynasty, you would say Tian Cha. So if any vessels you were to see from Song Dynasty, for easing clay, they would most probably be used to boil water, right? They 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 were not brewing, brewing uh tea leaves at all, right? They were just whisking uh fine tea dust into a, a foamy uh creamy drink, right? And if you move to the next next dynasty itself, right? And this is also an image from the uh, Song Dynasty, right? So you can see uh, uh Song Dai Dian Cha, it's a very uh, elaborate process. Uh, the tea that they used to uh, whisk in this is called the uh, Long Tuan Feng Bing, uh, the kind of uh, tea processing method itself. Um, it's somewhat lost. Right? I, I don't think anybody in China right now is able to produce uh, uh, the tea to the same same properties or standards to be whisked. Right? But I think someday someone is going to find out the real process. Yeah. Right? So uh, if you were to say uh, this uh, zi sha hu or purple clay itself, right, one of the earliest evidences that we associate with tea-related um, cultures or tea-related uh, methods itself uh, is actually uh, through the digging of uh, ancient kilns, right? So Yang Jiao San is actually a kiln in, uh, in, in, in Yixing where they actually uh, excavated uh, pieces of um, uh, Yixing, uh, uh, Yixing clay uh, parts, you know, of a pitcher, a lid, you know, like you see in the picture here, right? And most, the most cool thing about this, right, is that um, uh, in, in some ways, these vessels itself will correlate to the brewing method at the time, which I say Song Dynasty, most probably Yixing vessels will used to boil water. And not only that, in historical records and historical drawings, right, you'll find, or even paintings, right, you'll find that actually uh, you do see some resemblances, you know, of uh, the uh, water water heating, you know, kind of a, a application to the picture, right? Uh, so this is somewhat like, I would say, um, uh, one of the earliest evidences of uh, using zisa in terms of uh, um, uh, tea-related application to boil water. Then as you move on to the Ming Dynasty, right, you find that, oh, the Ming Dynasty, uh, everybody would say that, oh, the emperor who founded the Ming Dynasty was a barbarian of some sort, you know, he never liked, you know, all these formalities of whisking tea and all that. So he was one of the emperors who kind of like uh, uh, insisted or allowed, you know, um, the change in the tea format, the tea tribute, you know, to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the imperial, you know, palace, right? He says that, oh, it's okay to supply loose leaf tea, right? You don't have to compress or make this uh, uh, long tuang feng bing, you know, this kind of uh, uh, compressed tea cakes, right? So this uh, greatly changed the, the, the way tea was being, you know, uh, used. Right, being being enjoyed, so um, with that itself, you you find that actually the birth of the the, the teapot, you know, in terms of uh, brewing tea itself, would definitely correlate with the uh, Ming Dynasty, where where uh the the loose leaf tea application or usage was um, uh kind of permitted and uh, becoming more and more popular. Yeah, so I think uh, if you were to uh look at uh zisha hu or t uh zisha teapots itself, right? It's in a systematic manner itself or through the dynasties, we would say that uh in the tea brewing application, right? Uh, Ming Dynasty was the birth of uh using uh teapots in terms of uh, tea brewing, right? And then uh the next iconic era that followed from the Ming Dynasty itself would be the early Qing Dynasty, where uh the first three emperors uh of Qin Dynasty itself, uh, they believed, I mean, it's believed among collectors, right, that the best uh, Zhu Ni, 
uh, pots were made from uh, made during this period right and then uh, another important era itself is when you know uh, trade has uh, uh, between between China and you know neighboring countries have largely um, uh, been more open that there are actually more creations for uh, the region like for Japan you know Nanyang and Thailand right this is uh, this occurred mostly during the late Qing to the early ROC period and then uh, there's also an icon iconic era that occurred was the 1930s to 40s where there was just lots of war and disorder right in 1958 to 61 the great leap forward in china right so uh, i mean i'm just listing all these points right is that basically uh, you you would see how all these uh, historic events itself would end up uh, uh, changing the way uh, teapots were being made and um in 1966 to 76 you have the cultural revolution Right, that also changed something in the uh, Yixing Zisha uh, teapot um, uh, design or something, right? Or not design, I mean the way it's being uh, exported and the way it's being uh, uh, labeled, right? And of course, uh, we will also have um, uh, from 1978, right, when uh, Deng Xiaoping started, you know, opening China out to the world. And uh, with that itself, there were more and more liberal, you know, um, Chinese economic reforms that allow artists and artisans to actually express themselves a bit more freely. Which also marked another era in uh, uh the production of mass produced uh to sour wares. right and of course uh, from eighties onwards you can see that the booming trade you know all the way uh from eighties until now itself right it's just a uh, uh, exponential growth in China's uh trade with the rest of the world, yeah, so um let's let's just uh, take a first uh historical I mean I'm just I just showed you the um uh kind of like a, a structure of which we'll just run through right so you have a better understanding of uh. Uh, I, I made it quite, uh, I mean, specific in some ways and unspecific in some ways so that uh, it doesn't become too too heavy. I hope it's not too heavy at the moment. I mean, if you have any comments, you can always type a uh, response, you know, so that I can just uh, look at the screen. Right, is the speed okay? Is the uh, pronunciation okay, you know, and can you all hear, you know, this is important. Right, so... Uh, Ming Dai Zisahu, which is Ming Dynasty Zisahu itself, right? Uh, it was believed that uh the first uh uh Zisahu or the first founders or makers of a uh, Zisah teapots is actually a monk from the Golden Sand Monastery. They call the Jing Sa Shi Sheng. So the, the this this monk was known to actually uh, uh pinch uh teapots out of uh purple clay, or they said uh Wu Se Tu means five color clay. So um the the mining or the collection of Yixing clay in the Ming Dynasty is definitely not as sophisticated as the Qing or the modern uh, heavy machinery methods. So uh, what uh, most probably in the Ming Dynasty they had access to was uh, surface material through a lot of uh, weathering. So uh, it would probably be a combination of um, many different kind of uh, uh, ores and different kind of uh, uh, weathered rock materials. So the color is definitely uh, generally a lot more colorful. So which is why in the early records itself they always say Yixing Zisha is Wu Se Tu. Wu Se Tu means five color clay. Five color clay. Yep. So um so in uh Ming Dynasty uh written record by uh Zhou Zhou Gao Qi, right, he wrote this book called Yang Xian uh Ming Hu Si. Right. So this Yang Xian Ming Hu Si itself, um he, he wrote in the Ming Dynasty the birth of uh Zisha Hu and he has lots of nice drawings of uh pots during the era. So all the famous uh pots by Shida Bin and all that you can see the the uh drawings in his book, right, which you can correlate to uh museum specimens today. Yeah. So um so the iconic event, right? So you have this uh, monk who found this lovely clay and he made pots out of it. And then there was another uh famous event that was recorded was a little uh servant boy, a little servant boy of uh uh Wing Shan who who whom was actually um spending time in retreat at the Golden Sand Monastery. And this little uh servant boy, his name called Gong Chun, right, he uh kind of like uh, saw saw how you know the clay was being made into pots and all that. So he actually um pinched a pot out of the clay and that became the legendary Gong Chun Hu. Right. So if you ever see Gong Chun Hu in terms of um uh the name, you know, anybody selling a Kong Chun Hu itself, you find that the shape itself doesn't look very uh, symmetrical. You know, it looks like a hand-pinched, handmade uh, uh, pot itself. And that is actually the innate uh, spirit of the Kong Chun design. So if you were to uh, collect or 
want to buy any Gong Chun Hu, you know, you do not want to buy one that is like made from a perfect mold or something. You want to buy something that is uh, probably closer to, to, to the spirit or nature of how it had been designed, which is just a hand-pinched uh, 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 version of it. And the truth is that uh, for, for Gong Chun Hu itself, the exact specimen made by Gong Chun was uh, lost in history. Even the pieces in the museums remain to be unverified. So uh, there is no, no clear example of what uh, Gong Chun had really, really done except for some drawings in books. Yeah. So in the Ming Dynasty itself, like I said, you know, they, they would say um, the clay itself is mostly from a surface uh, weathered material. They have no specific mining, uh, deep mining. So uh, you would see that the, the clay material itself would be uh, coarse, complicated, uh, sophisticated. And if you look under a microscope, it's really colorful. Right, like five color clay, right. So this is something that um, uh, we have to to um, uh, take note of. And of course, I guess um, uh, if you're watching this lecture itself, you're right. I, I don't think anybody's in the in the realm or in the sphere of collecting uh, Ming Dynasty teapots or stuff because uh, Ming Dynasty pots are definitely very low in volume, very expensive, and not easy to authenticate. Right. So these are uh, I would say deep waters. Right. So um. From this uh Ming Dynasty itself, right, through various uh you know we call uh written records itself, right? So there there are actually uh, uh poets, you know, who wrote poems uh in the Ming Dynasty. Uh they write something about uh buying a new vessel from Yi Xing, right? So this is um basically um describing that uh, uh he bought, you know, uh, a new new vessel from, from Yi Xing. So, which means that in Ming Dynasty, it's probably the official start. And uh, at the same time, uh, from the digging or the excavations or the tomb robbing of uh, uh, old tombs, right? Like Ming, Ming Dai Jia Qing Nian, you know, uh, Jia Qing Si Nian, this uh, uh, Ming Dynasty tomb itself, you know, they excavated and found this beautiful uh, Ti Liang Zi Sha Hu, right? So, so this is a um, huge, you know, huge, huge uh, a pot. And, and it correlates with the way tea was being brewed, you know, loose leaves in a big pot, right? So this is uh, something that uh, we would say uh, typical of, of that period of time, right? So on the uh, first first image on the top left, you see that is uh, uh, an example of the Gong Chun Hu, which, you know, in China, they believe this to be a real item, but there is just no... no uh, uh, Evidence, you know, there's not enough uh, historical provenance to, to confirm it, but it's, it found its way into a museum in, 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 in China. So this is a, a version of a uh, rough and rustic uh, Gong Chung Hu. And then uh, if you were to uh, look at Ming Dynasty itself, uh, there were uh, very great, you know, um, forms and shapes. Right, I would say that pottery in China or porcelain in China itself, you know, ever since the, the uh, beginning of... Um, this sort of uh, makings from the Tang to Song Dynasty, you know, from Tang San Chai all the way down to Long Quan Yao, Ru Yao, and all that, right? You find that uh, porcelain and pottery itself is a very um, strong, strong. Uh, I mean, uh, trade. You know that that they they put in a lot of efforts itself to 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 designing to curvatures to lines, you know, and the shapes, right? So even in the Ming Dynasty itself, you'd say that although it's the birth of uh Yi Xing pottery itself. I'm sure these uh, artisans that made pots then probably have uh, had been inspired by, by uh, in many ways, and they're able to deliver very good uh, shapes and 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 uh, I would say uh, uh, designs, you know, uh, in pots. So you can see, for example, this is actually a very famous um, inverted uh, tripod pot, right? So it's a rare, expensive pot by Shadabin, who is one of the greatest makers in the Ming Dynasty. Right, so the the pot is huge, and the aim of the lid, right, is so that when you need to drink, right, you can actually take the lid off, turn it around, so it sits like a three-legged cup. Right, like I, I have one here, but it's not, it's a Japanese three-legged cup, yeah. But you have a three-legged cup using the lid, you can pour tea into it for drinking, right? So this is uh, typically, uh, I mean, in the Ming Dynasty, they have already came up with such cool designs. Yeah, so that's pretty uh, awesome. Right, but as you can take note, right, the pots are still tremendously big. Right, and then um, at the end of the Ming Dynasty itself to the early Qing Dynasty, that is actually the real uh, birth of Gongfu Cha, 
So the Kung Fu Chao or Kung Fu Tea, you know, phenomena, right, has gone crazy everywhere. Not only, I mean, in China, people are crazy about it. Around the world, everywhere, you know, in the West, you know, and all that, people are crazy about it. So, uh, uh, uh they, they talk about Kung Fu Cha, Kung Fu Cha, and actually Kung Fu Cha itself, you know, you cannot date it back to the uh, Lui Cha Jing or the Tang Dynasty. Uh, the real birth of Kung Fu Cha is actually uh, in the uh, end of Ming to early Qing Dynasty. And that's typically because um, the, the, the way Kung Fu Cha, the vessels that they use, including the very small Meng Chen Hu, the small Zhu Ni pots, right, uh, this... Pots, there is almost, I mean, I've never seen, an, and there is no written records of any small Juni pots being made in the Ming Dynasty. Right, there are some medium sized ones, but uh, for purpose of Kung Fu Cha usage, right, there is no such uh, 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 pot and no such uh, records of it, you know, uh, uh, in the Ming Dynasty. So, so we most confidently, confidently say that, you know, with this exponential increase of uh, small Juni pots in the um, early Qing dynasty, that is actually uh, correlated to the birth of the Kung Fu, cha, uh, Kung Fu tea culture. Right. So, uh, during the early Qing dynasty, we will see that there are two, two types of pots you can see. Right. One type is uh, very small Juni pots for Kung Fu Cha, while uh, they, are, they are big uh, zisa pots, you know, from all sorts of different clays itself, that is still uh, brewing tea in the uh, loose leaf, uh, kind of like a, a huge steeping manner uh, as per the previous dynasties, yeah. Right, so uh, I would say uh, uh, Qing, early Qing, just take note that this is when you get uh, the birth of uh, uh, these little cute pots. Right, so in the early Qing dynasty itself, right, there was also uh, quite amount, a good amount of trade, you know, between um, uh, China and of course uh, to exporting uh, tea wares to, 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 to Holland and other places, you know. So um, if, if you see some of these lovely pieces itself, they actually uh, never went underground. They're never from tombs. They're not from uh, sunken ships and all that, right? Uh, many of these are actually uh, being passed down in families in Holland, right, Netherlands. So I had friends who, who, who used to roam uh, the flea markets of Netherlands and buying, you know, these lovely pots at the at a small fraction of the price, right? So, uh, but the good good times and good days are over. You know, there is no no opportunity for that to happen anymore because I think in the collector collector sphere itself, transparency and knowledge is now more and more um, uh, widespread. It's more and more um, uh, uh, I mean, open access. So, so do don't expect uh getting a cheap deal or cheap thrill, but in the end, uh, the more important thing is to actually. Uh, understand and appreciate why these uh, pots are so sought after or so 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 uh, enjoyable to to use and own, right? So uh, in the Qing Dynasty, there are uh, some of these um uh, Zhu Ni like uh, pots, right? That are medium to large size, and uh for the very huge size ones, they actually do blend in some sand, right? So this is a, a future topic. But then um uh, if you were to understand the, the the nature of the material you find that uh, a very fine clay cannot easily make a big vessel without cracking uh, or deforming during firing or usage. Right, so there's actually a bit of sand inside. So these are called zhu sa guan. Right, and of course, uh, if you look at the uh, early Qing dynasty itself, you know, uh, through all the different uh, uh, tomb ratings, you know, from, from southern China, uh, Fujian to Vietnam, Right, so you, you have a myriad of um, lovely little Juni pots that will come out, and these pots are all dating back to early Qing, which means it's somewhere around Kangxi, Yongzhen, and Qianlong. Right, so these are Qing Shang Dai. It's called Qing Shang Dai. It means uh, it's, it's the first, in principle, the, the first, I would say the first three emperors, because Sun Tzu is the first emperor anyway, yeah, but, but he was not a superb or slightly defunct emperor, so, so they kind of like uh, uh, put the first, first three emperors to be Kangxi, uh, Qianlong, Yongzhen, you know, in terms of uh, Qing Shang Dai. Yeah, so uh, the, this small pots itself, the size of volume will range from around uh, 120 cc to 150 cc, you know, uh, some about 180 as well. But these pots were all significantly smaller than uh, the Ming Dynasty sizes. Ming Dynasty, you'll find pots of uh, 1 liter, you know, uh, 1.5 liter size, you know. So uh, that would mean that uh, when you have pots of this small size and such a fine material itself, it means that in your tea brewing practice, you would be definitely um, uh, doing multiple small steeps, 
right? So these multiple small steps is the kind of like a, one of the fundamental uh, uh, ways of controlling the brew and of course uh, important aspect of uh, Kung Fu Kung Fu Cha. Yeah, and uh, from the Ming Dynasty until the uh, ROC period, you know, until about 1950s, right? Uh, you'd say that uh, all the teapots made in Yixing were all fired through the dragon kiln. Right, so the, the dragon kiln is actually the main way uh, teapots are being fired ever since the Ming Dynasty uh, all the way until 1950s. Right, so uh, if you visit uh, some of the uh, uh, kilns in, 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 in Yixing, of which most of the dragon kilns are no longer functional, right, just only for tourists, you know, tourist kind of uh, um, uh, visit and all that. Right, you'll find that uh, the, the, the kilns are large, right? I think it's a 50 meters uh, average. They have very many of them, these in Yixing. At the same time, right, most of the Yixing teapots uh, from history, right, are being fired in, we call it uh, containers, you know, or uh, kind of like a cistern kind of container so that uh, the ash and the uh, uh, dirt and all that from the wood firing in the dragon kiln will not contaminate or... Uh, or spoil the, the surface of the teapots. So if you find, you, if you see a lot of uh, very high-end or very nice uh, Yixing pots from, from the early Qing dynasty and all that, you find that the surfaces are almost typically uh, flawless. Yeah, so, so that's because they fired in the cistern and this has been done ever since, you know, beginning of uh, time. Right, even in in your this uh jian zan, you know, in 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 a uh, uh temoku in in the early you know uh song dynasties and all that stuff, they already had the bo, you know, which is a assistant or a vessel to to hold the 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 bow during firing, so that the dust and ash specks will not dirty or contaminate the vessel. Yep. So the typical dragon kiln, right? You can see. Oh, this is like no firing, and and dragon kiln itself is is complicated. Uh, this will also uh, eventually link into, you know, why people would say that uh, uh, some of the uh, Qing Dynasty uh, pots itself, they have a, we call it black bone or hei gu, which means that uh, when you crack or you chip, you know, uh, 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 Yixing, uh, early era Yixing pot itself, you find that although it's a zhu ni or red pot itself, when you crack it, you actually have a dark, 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 uh, purplish or dark blackish kind of a uh, interior. So they call it Hei Gu, which is called black bone. And that's because um, in Dragon Kiln itself, right, there is always a process of what we call the cyclic uh, oxidation and reduction. That's because uh, when you throw in fresh wood, right, the wood itself will combust, you know, and then there will be like an oxidation phase itself. And as the wood smolders itself into charcoal, you will start drawing oxygen away, you know, during its combustion. And then that is going to induce a bit of reduction before it no uh, air re-entry will then re-oxidize it again. So uh, the, the, the dragon kiln firing is about two weeks usually for, for Yixing uh, pots last time. So the pots it will be subjected to uh, cyclic oxidation and reduction at the same correlated rate to the way they feed the burning material. Right? So that's a very unique aspect of, uh, of, 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 of pots during that period of time which we cannot replicate today because most of the pots are being gas or, or, or electric fired nowadays yeah right so uh this is a a just an example of a, a, a dragon kiln firing you know we do have two in singapore you know there are there are two dragon kilns in singapore which are still active right um you can see that they have this little uh not little yeah but these are kind of like mid-sized you know uh containers itself of which uh your precious uh pots are being fired inside so that you don't get contaminated or dirty with all the ash yeah, so uh, there's an image of an old dragon kiln on a hill slide, right? On a hill slide, this is uh, typically uh, how a dragon kiln is being, uh, I mean, structured, right? And then the, the, they'll, they'll burn and then the heat will just uh, tra will travel uh, uh, up the, 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 the whole um, uh, kiln, right? So before um, <coughs> the, the uh, nationalization of uh, Yixing uh, production as a factory and all that itself, like I said, up to 1950s itself, uh, most of the... Uh, Yixing pots are fired in dragon kilns, so you can see these are all the different dragon kilns uh, that were known to exist in, in, in Yixing alone, right? Without, uh, I mean, uh, before, uh, during the 50s, right? So these are all the uh, kilns of different lengths, mostly about uh, 60, 70 meters long, shorter ones are about 50, 
like so many so many so many chicken kilns right and uh, the amount of wood they consume you know uh, was estimated to be about uh, 1.6 million tons i think that is uh, an understatement lah <laughs> depends on how many times they fire a year right so uh, this is uh, the, the the typical uh, craze you know i mean yixing wares were just you know made in so many places and in yixing and fired through so many different kilns yeah so uh let's move on to talk about another uh iconic era in collecting yixing pots is that uh, you will, just now i talked about you know ming dynasty huge pots the qing dynasty uh the first three emperors i mean the, the qing san dai era where you have the greatest chuni pots and then uh the next uh iconic era we can see in yixing pots in terms of what you can see on the market is um pots that were made for export typically uh, to Thailand, uh, Japan, and to Southeast Asia, right? So in Japan, there is a very good, um, I mean, uh, I mean a, a, a series of very good uh, tea-related, I mean, um, uh, arts itself, which we call Senchado, uh, Jin Cha Dao. So Jin Cha Dao itself, uh, they actually loved, uh, they actually loved uh, using uh, Yixing teapots in their, uh, kind of like a tea, pro- uh, tea brewing processes itself. So if you ever have the fine fortune of uh, going to Japan during uh, the Senchado big events, you know, they have actually uh, flea markets where you can actually find very nice uh, uh, Qing Dynasty Yixing teapots at uh, not too bad prices. Lah. I would say that as of uh, today itself, uh, a lot of um, uh, good Yixing pots itself uh, from the late ROC to, I mean, uh, late Qing Dynasty to early ROC periods itself, are mostly found in Japan. I mean, easy access. You just need to go to Yahoo Japan uh, auctions and you just need to have a keen eye and of course, a, kind of like a degree of a budget that you are willing to, to, to spend. You know, you can actually bid for some really lovely uh, uh, pots. And uh, I mean, I have not bid it for many years because uh, nowadays it's just so, so, so competitive. You know, so, so and, and of course, I, 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 I think I do have quite many pots, you know, so, so I'm just slowing down right now. Right, but in some ways, um, just not talking about uh, procurement or anything, but just talking about appreciating the pots in terms of the era, there will be um, a period of time where you see that, um, uh, I mean, in history of Yixing pots itself, right, is that you see that there's a lot of these uh, finely polished, highly polished um, uh, pots. So these are actually being ground with uh, emery sand or kind of abrasive in water so that the, the, the exterior of the pot becomes really, really nice and glossy. This is a practice that is highly favored in Thailand. So uh, if you were to go to River City in Thailand or similar, you know, if you were to buy pots from there, uh, a lot of them, uh, in terms of uh, zisha, duan ni, and all that, are almostly um, ground. The surfaces are ground. But one fortunate or one good thing, right, is that zhu ni pots, red clay pots in Thailand, mostly they don't grind, they don't mill. Right, so the surface uh, for, for red clay pots are always uh, natural and jade-like. So these are some uh, nice items you can consider uh, picking up from there. Right, but um, because of demand from Thailand, uh, Japan, and of course Southeast Asia itself, right, uh, uh, pots of this, uh, I mean, these sort of materials and designs itself, a large amount was actually being uh, exported to this region. Right, so um, you just have to, I mean, uh, keep, keep a lookout. And uh, nowadays, I would say that uh, for... For, for Thai pots itself, uh, mostly in Thailand. For Chuni pots, I would say proportion wise, there's a very good amount, a very large amount in Taiwan. Right, there is a selected amount in Southeast Asia in terms of, in terms of collection volume. And uh, there is uh, quite a good amount also in Japan. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, something you can always uh, uh, think about if you want to procure something, where to find. Yeah. Right, and of course, uh, in the, the ROC period itself, um, <coughs> there, there was um, a lot of uh, little uh, small workshops that branched out, you know. And, and you, you can say that um, the the, the Yixing teapots of this uh, Ming Guo Qi itself, they carry themselves uh, with a kind of, you know, um, uh, the kind of spirit of the Chinese uh, artistry, you know, like they have the Chinese uh, Hua Pai. The Lingnan Hua Pai, all these different kind of uh, uh, painting or calligraphy uh, uh, schools itself. So they, there is a lot of uh, character. There is a lot of, um, uh, I would say, um, uh, skill as well. So uh, if you were to collect pots from the ROC period itself, one of the key important aspects is that you want to be collecting uh, pots 
that carry the flavor of the ROC period, which means that uh, it'll be probably like this one pot here where you can see, you know, excellent calligraphy, right? And the shape itself is just so, um, I would say, so, so, so uh, uh, sharp and characteristic itself. Right. On the other hand, right, there are also uh, some of these uh, Japanese export type of um, uh, periods, uh, pots for this period itself. But definitely this itself will carry a different uh, artistic flavor. Yeah. So you can see this pair of little uh, uh, Sunni pots here, you know, this uh, also from the ROC era, right? With uh, the Hatsutra uh, similar, you know, uh, inscribed all over the pot with a needle or something, right? So, so these are all unique features of the workmanship in this particular uh, period of time, right? So if you were to collect, remember, the pot itself will speak to you. Like, I mean, if you were to see a pot like this, you will be somewhat, you know, uh, drawn to think, you know, of the workmanship, right? You can you be drawn to think of the artisan itself, the way you know he carries himself, the the artistic flair and the character that he would to inject in his creations, right? This is something that we have to appreciate, uh, in, in whenever you want to do some collecting, yeah. So um, just uh, le leaping up from the ROC period itself or towards the uh nineteen uh, thirties to fifties, you know. This period of time is actually one of the most unstable uh, periods in, in China. Right? As you can see, China itself, there was just so much um, internal fighting right? you know, between the democratic parties and the, the uh, communist sides. You know? And also there was the uh, unfortunate Second World War. Right? So, so pots from 30s to 50s itself are uh, one of the smallest production volumes right? uh, in, in the history of uh, Yixing West. Right? Um, then um I mean not 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 much to talk about nineteen thirties or fifties fifties you know I think uh I I spoke to even a few of uh, the the Yixing porters itself right they say that thirties to fifties is almost like a like a information blackout period right you you don't find much records of anything you don't find much you know um uh, operation or production um that's what I mean everybody has been saying so so uh even in my current research itself it's it's it just seem that uh, 30s to 50s is actually a very uh, small and low volume uh, kind of um, uh, uh, period, right? And then um, when uh, the Chinese uh, country stabilized itself in 1949 with uh, their decided, you know, uh, national leaders and their decided political system, if, if any, yeah, right, that they uh, started, you know, having this sort of uh, uh, stabilization, uh, that it's being you know um kind of like a uh, uh, quite welcome you know after having so much um disruption and so much uh, uh war and all that right so uh in the early fifties itself right there, there there was actually a lot of what we call the um recovery of reformation where recovery where where people start coming back to the trades that they used to do right so in nineteen fifties early fifties itself uh there there were formation of little uh uh production groups. Right, and these little groups itself, uh, they they kind of like uh, became little cooperatives, and the pots being sold during that period of time were only costing about fifty cents to a dollar twenty each, right? So um, in the uh nineteen uh fifties itself or uh, nineteen fifty six itself, right? There was also a a period of, a record in time. I mean, history of uh Yixing pot making, right? That they tried to use a uh, plaster molds to make uh uh teapots. I would say that Yixing teapots mostly in history could be mold assisted. It means that they do have molds to help you adjust the angle, to make sure it's really round and all that. There is definitely a degree of mold assistance. But um in the late fifties, right, nineteen fifties right, itself, right, this uh use of plaster molds, right, we wouldn't call it a uh, mold assisted. I would say it's called mold dependent uh pot formation. Right. The only reason for that is because uh, instead of uh, making pot by pot, you know, like one pot or two pots a day itself, right? They want to make uh, hundreds a day per person, right? Just to reach a scale up where they can boost the economy, right? So uh, in 1956, uh, it, it was said that uh, that was when they had the first um, uh, official uh, usage of a more dependent method of making, which was made from plaster, right? So these are some examples of the uh, plaster mold that uh, being used to make uh, standard teapots, you know, the molds are being used to make almost every single part of the teapot. The lid, the handle, the spout, and the body are all mold dependent. Right. 
uh, this itself um, is quite a, a important uh, thing to consider when you are collecting or trying to authenticate pots, right? There are definitely uh, lines or marks where the the, the, the mold was being opened, you can actually tell from that. Yeah. Right, and um, moving, you know, uh, from, 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 from uh, the short histories of 1950s itself, right, there was a period of time, um, I would say towards 1958 itself, where there was this huge, huge uh, national movement, they called the Great Leap Forward, right, it's a sad, I mean, happy, sad, it's a sad, yeah, sad part of uh, Chinese history because of all the sacrifices of, 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 of people, you know. But uh, the aim of the Great Leap Forward was just to 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 kind of like um, uh, get themselves boosted to 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 to, to greater economies, right? So uh, in in nineteen fifty eight, uh, aligned with this theme of uh industrialization and also trying to uh, uh progress in terms of uh, production and exports itself, right? Um, the official Zisa Yi Chang, which means the Factory One, right, was uh was was uh founded not founded I say it was uh incorporated you know during this uh, this year itself, where um they wanted to expand or kind of like a uh formalize expand and scale up uh zisa production itself, right so uh all the master artisans itself then would uh kind of like a hire. Uh, many new uh artisans and helpers. So so some helpers itself would be doing the firing, while uh some of the young artisans itself would be definitely uh doing the mold molding of uh, teapots, right. And most of the uh master craftsmen in this factory one itself, their role was to design the shape, and also design the mold, to be used for mass production. Right. This is uh factory one beginning. Right. The the beginning of a massive, large scale, uh, mass production of zisa pots. Right, so uh, this is just example of a nineteen seventies kind of a mold. Uh, this is a plaster mold for the body, right? Your Qing Ying Zhongguo Wulong, which is your six cup uh, red clay, uh, Xu Ping pot, right? They use a plaster mold for the body, and then there is another mold for the lid, where you just put the clay in, you hammer it, you get the lid. Yeah. And then there's also the mold from the bottom piece, the base. So basically, uh, parts from the that that mold itself, right? You can tell from the gradient, you know, of the the bottom piece, right? The shape and everything else, right? These are all the identifying marks, right? Which you can probably explore later on if you're interested in collecting. But uh, this is just an example of how molds are being used to mass produce uh uh teapots. Right, and uh, one also important aspect is that. Factory One has never used a dragon kiln, right? This is the ultimate truth, right? Uh, there are so many funny merchants in Nanyang or, or Southeast Asia that, that say, you know, oh, I have this rare 60s, 70s dragon kiln, Zuni pot and all that, right? I mean, that is definitely not possible, right? It's untrue, right? Because um, China has gone into a phase of um, uh, communist uh, structure, and control that uh there will be no private ownership of anything no private uh business activities so everything else is from a national uh, level kind of directive so in the aspect itself there is no private uh, artisans and no small workshops that are ever uh in place only until very much later when uh china kind of like relaxed its own um uh, rulings and a lot of privatization and private ownership that was in probably close to the eighties already, right? So um in the nineteen fifty eight itself, factory one chose to use the downdraft kiln, right? Downdraft kiln is actually a, a, a gas fired kiln, right? Which uh was uh used to produce most of the wares during nineteen fifty eight, uh, onwards, right? This uh downdraft kiln was being used all the way until uh I think early seventies, right? Where they changed to a uh, constant tunnel firing. Yeah, so there is no dragon kiln in factory one. Uh, uh, uh I would say, uh, t t t wear firing, right? And uh, one important thing also to note, right, is that um, there are just so many. I mean, Yixing clay is actually a very interesting material itself because, um, it's all about mining down, uh, a strata. The deeper you go, you get different layers or different clays. You know, right? So so it, it's such a fun, fun kind of a uh, uh, material to play with. So many colors, so many properties itself. But 
in Yixing Factory 1, they did not use all these exotic clays, right? So you don't have all your, you know, uh, Chiang Bo Ni, they don't have your Zhu Ni and all that. And that's because, you know, all the clays that was being used by Factory 1 was being supplied by a company in Yixing called Yixing Kuang Ye Gong Si. So the Yixing Kuang Ye Gong Si itself, right, would have, um, under the national uh, directive itself, or, or, the, or, or of mass production, they would actually um, ping to it, means that we will actually combine clays to give only just a few standard colors. So in the ancient times, you can see there's so many different kind of clays, right, that would have, you know, uh, I mean, different from different structures itself. But uh, in early factory one itself, the Kuang Yit Gong Si just combined everything together. They blend everything together. So, so what factory one will be receiving will be a batch of Duan Ni, right? One batch of Zi Ni, one batch of Hong Ni, you know? So the kind of, um, of, of um, uh, I would say, bulk, bulk combination of different structures of clay itself to give a consistent uh, clay material itself is important for mass production. And that's because uh, you won't want a clay material that is like, you know, uh, every day the clay material is different strata and then the firing temperature is different, right? The 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 firing properties and shrinkage is different. That would be a nightmare for consistency. So they would rather uh, combine and blend everything into a huge bulk, homogeneous bulk, so that uh, all the Hongli from, from a certain production will be all mostly uh, 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 constant. Right, so... Um, uh, in, in this case itself, in early factory one, uh, you, you definitely see that uh, they don't have all that exotic clay names, right? They have, you know, maybe Pen San or Tuan Ni, right? They will have the uh, uh, purple clay and then they will have the um, uh, red clay and then they have something like the purple uh, Qing Shui Ni, right? So, so these are just the few uh, main clay types that they, they used so that you don't have to um, uh, go into intricacies of you know trying to balance out all different firing temperatures and all different um, uh, surface flaws of teapots and all that right so take note there is no zhu ni in factory one never right the zhu ni itself if ever they find they'll just throw it to be bulk blended into the hong ni so that's why the hong ni of the early um uh, 60s itself uh 56 and, and 50s to early 60s itself has such a nice texture itself and that's because uh, probably a lot of good material has gone into mark blending. Yeah. Right. And also another um, uh, uh, unique uh, part of the factory one history is that uh, in 1958 itself, um, you, you know that most people would say that uh, two things about Yixing clays, right? Yixing clay number one cannot be real thrown. Means that you cannot spin it like a Cao Zhou Hu. That's one thing that people say about real Yixing clay. The second thing people say about Yixing clay, right? It's that Yixing clay cannot be slip casted. Right, it cannot be uh, slip casted, and uh, this is actually proven wrong because uh, in nineteen fifty eight itself, right there because of the great leap forward, everybody wanted to increase productivity. That's because you know in Qing Dezhen itself, they could you know um, slip cast and produce so many you know vessels and wares in short time, but Yixing itself is still a slow, uh, more pressing, more dependent uh, production. So they did try slip casting. Uh, uh, Zisha pots by grinding the Zisha to uh, ultra fine puree using uh, methods they copied from Qing Dezhen. They started making slip custard pots uh, in 1958, but then uh, it was abandoned uh, quite soon. That was because uh, Yixing clay itself, uh, when you try to take it up from the cluster mold after you slip cast it, right, there's a lot of uh, surface defects. So they had to spend a lot of effort to actually uh, touch up. So uh, if you are careful on the market, uh, sometimes you are, you are lucky, right? You can actually purchase or spot these little slip custard uh, 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 eating pots. These were all only made between 1958 to about 1960 maybe. Right, and uh, this was a piece I formerly owned. Uh, if you own a slip cast eating pot, a rare pot from this era, please do not brew or douse it with hot water. That's because the slip custard material itself uh, is very fragile. Right, most people end up cracking uh, their slip cast pots right, because they try to brew tea in it. Right, and you also take note that uh, in this uh, Yixing slip casted pots itself, right, uh, from this 1958 to 60, uh, the body is slip casted, but the lid is molded by hand. So, so uh, on the market, if you ever come across uh, buying a piece of slip casted Yixing from this period, the lid and the body will definitely be two colors. Yeah, just take note about that. 
right? But this method was being abandoned because uh, it was not uh, uh, allowing them to have a fast production, right? So uh, moving on itself, uh, in the early factory period itself, right? Uh, I would say the clay materials from 58 to 65, right? Most people would, uh, who were collecting pots from, from the factory era would definitely uh, praise the clay materials from this period. And that's because um, I would say it reflects, you know, the quality of clay in this period reflects the sentiment of people during that time, right? The best clay they could find, the best clay they had, right? Everything was just blended in to make the best products for, for national pride, for export and all that. So um, this is why uh, pots from the 60s, early 60s, you know, uh, are still quite collectible uh, in, in almost everywhere, you know, uh, once you have clay easing for long enough. And that's because of the material. And also that uh, this material quality came from a sentiment that we can see in the era, right? So uh, I would say, uh, 年代特征, this is what I mean. You know, you have to see it in the, in the, in the, in the uh, pot material and the workmanship as well. Yeah. So uh, this is not important, but it's just some of the seals that was being made. But uh, actually, I would say it's not important. But I mean, this this uh, uh, is somewhat important, right? Um, in, in the... Uh, teapot uh, market itself, you come across so many, we call the sixth character, Liu Zi Zhang, uh, Yixing teapots, right? So, uh, one thing to take note, right, is that most of the pots with the sixth character seal, Liu Zi Zhang for Shui Ping Hu, right, uh, or any of teapots that, uh, small teapots that are being made in Factory 1 in the early 60s, right? Uh, the Liu Zi Zhang, right, you would definitely see uh, this Yixing Hui Man Cheng, this is actually uh, quite commonly used in uh, end 50s to early 60s. This uh, Si Jiao Si, you can see the four little uh, 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 lines here, right? This Si Jiao Si here is uh, a seal that's being used all the way from ROC and Le Qing, ROC all the way until early, I mean, end 50s, right? Should be somewhere around there. Right, maybe early sixties have a, have a have a have have a few pieces, but the early sixties itself, right, will have this tuan jiao because the seal broke, I think. Right, so I I, I probably can find us a, a a sample for you if I can, uh, see you can find it. Yeah, so um, this is a, a, a factory one. There was some of this, right? Nan Meng Cheng, right? This seal itself from uh ROC, uh all the way until uh early factory era until early 60s, this seal was also being used. Right, Da, da Zi Xi, right, this is actually uh, believed to be uh, early to mid 60s. Right, so the, the uh, seal Jing Xi, right, Jing Xi Hui Meng Cheng Zi, right, it's actually very interesting. Jing Xi is actually the old name for Yi Xing, right. Yi Xing's uh, a former historical name is called Jing Xi. Hui Meng Cheng, right, is actually, uh, we will call Hui Meng Cheng, is actually a Ming Dynasty, late Ming Dynasty, um, uh, pot maker, but as of today, no one knows who Hui Meng Cheng is, but he was just you know an iconic uh, uh, workshop or iconic you know artisan that all the pots in 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 small pots in future history of uh, Yixing was uh, all made using this uh, Meng Cheng as a as a as a kind of like a uh, uh, characteristic name for the pot style, right? So Meng Cheng Hu, Meng Cheng Hu, like Xu Ping Hu is always associated with Meng Cheng. So this uh, Liu Zhang or six character seal from from his history of uh, early factory one or earlier, right? Most of the Liu Zhi right are very orderly, which means that the seal itself, right? You can see that it's very good symmetry proportion, right? The script script is generally, uh, very um, uh, stoic, very uh, strict, you know, confined, and and uh this is uh in in any important uh aspect you know that you have to 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 remember right because uh such seals itself right in such orderly beautiful seals itself uh towards the 70s 80s they stopped using it right the six character seals of 1980s onwards right they are called luan zi zhang which means that the script itself is very uh grassy you know very uh disorderly right so this uh an I iconic uh uh era representation as well Right, uh, I mean also that uh, if you want to talk about uh collecting um pots right uh of this uh, early sixties itself, uh in the seals itself um there used to be a lot of uh, hidden details uh, right that um uh collectors used to have an upper hand, right so like so there's a hidden strip here 
right, there's a hidden line here, you know, all that. These were all used as a quick uh, identification um, or authentication, but definitely uh, not the only criteria, right? Because nowadays with modern technology, they could actually uh, kind of like a fun more, means they use a blue tag or some clay to kind of like a du duplicate the seal uh, 100%. Right, so so there has been such things happening uh in, in recent years, so uh you don't base on a seal alone, but this is just an indication. Yeah. Right, so you can see uh 60s material, <coughs> very um beautiful. Right, you have uh this uh, red clay itself with uh, yellow specks here. No, oh, this yellow specks here. So uh towards the uh later period you don't see all these uh yellow clumpy clumpy specks anymore in the material. Right, so these are some of the 60s, you know, kind of uh, pots. Right, and um, in the uh, pot history of, uh, I mean, on the pots that Factory One made also, <coughs> they are uh, kind of like uh, balancing uh, two aspects. One aspect was the experience that they had from uh, the late Qing to ROC period, where they would make pots based on their own aesthetics and their own ideals in design. But at the same time, uh, because of uh, the factory's uh, interest in exporting and doing business, right, they start to accept also, you know, uh, uh, design considerations that are for different markets, right? So this is an example of a, a late 60s. Is it late 60s? No, this is probably uh, uh, early 60s. Early 60s, uh, uh, Ge Zui, right? Uh, you call it the, the, the pigeon beak. But actually, it's more like a pigeon neck, you know, it's the, it's the kind of like a neck of a bird or something over here, right? But uh, what happened, right, is that um, during that period of time, uh, in, in, in Factory One, they were kind of like receiving orders from Japan and they were trying to find out what kind of tea that was being um, uh, appreciated or drank in Japan. And they found that it was actually a steamed uh, sencha, which is generally very twiggy, uh, small leaves, uh, narrow, uh, wispy little uh, beads, right? So uh, the usual uh, single hole filter on the Shui Ping pots or the other, you know, like uh, Mei Hua Kong or something like that, these, these six hole filters couldn't uh, elude the tea very well. So what they did then was just to, you know, uh, think of creating more holes inside the pot, like these 18 holes. So the girl tree here, which is called the uh, pigeon, uh, pigeon Big right, pot itself, they had uh, 18 holes. And uh, in order to account accommodate um, the filtration from 18 holes, right? They had to enlarge the bottom, this part of the, the, the pot here, so that it would actually become a, a, a bit rounder, so that it would allow the, um, all of the 18 holes to actually fit inside. Right, so this is one of the designs that they had changed. And also, uh, to, to, to follow the Japanese uh, side handle pots, right? They, they kind of like also put the sweeping pot handle on the side. Yeah, but this pot is, I mean, I have two pieces, you know, it's crazy, so hard to handle. But anyway, but this is just, just, just an, an, a, a historical uh, aspect that you would um, take note, you know, in your collecting or, or that, that uh, it speaks of an era. You know, an era where factory, a, a period where factory one tried to, you know, uh, cater some specialty wares to Japanese customers, right, and came up with this uh, particular uh, design. Right, and then um, moving on, right, as you know, uh, the most unfortunate thing that happened to China was the Cultural Revolution in 1966 to 76, right? So uh, this um, period, right, marked the birth of the common mark we see today, the Zhongguo Yixing uh, teapot mark, right? So the Zhongguo Yixing teapot mark, the aim was because uh, in the Cultural Revolution, they did not want any association with um, histor historical China, you know? Like Jingxi is like historical name of Yixing. Hui Mengcheng is a historical uh, uh, pot maker. So they tried to do away with all of that. And then it became more nationalistic. It's like Zhongguo Yixing. So Zhongguo Yixing Hu. So, th so this uh, Zhongguo Yixing seal only appeared at the beginning of the Cultural Revolu Revolution to meet this historical uh, need of doing away with culture. Right? So don't believe uh, Zhongguo Yixing pot from early ROC. Don't believe anybody who say Zhongguo Yixing seal from Qing Dynasty. No such thing, right? So this uh, only uh, came up uh, in, 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 in the beginning of Cultural Re Revolution, right? So this is something that uh, we have to, to uh, kind of like uh, appreciate in the history of, uh, of, 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 of teapots and, and why they are labeled that way, 
right? And of course, uh, during the the uh, Cultural Revolution period itself, um, there there are very nice brochures. You know, they made a lot of uh, standard pots. You know, big ones, small ones, right? But of course, if you have a copy of the brochure from that period of time, you'll be most set to understand or discover that most of the good using clay ended up being flower pots, right? So uh, you have this brochure itself, you find this brochure, 75% of the brochure is flower pots. Yeah, that was just because there was a huge demand for flower pots for bonsai and all these other uses then. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so uh, in the Cultural Re Revolution period itself, right, you would also um, uh, kind of like uh, understand or appreciate that, uh, uh, I mean, you observe, right, that uh, most of the small pots were made from red clay. But the big pots, the flower pots, right, they use very good uh uh Zisa Qing Shui Ni. Right. So you you ever collect any flower pots from this period of time, you find that the clay is is, is like the same clay you see in a big teapot from this period. Right. So I have seen so many. Right. And and, and it's, it's 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 I would say somewhat quite unfortunate because I'm a more of a tea person than a flower pot person, right? But I'm sure a flower pot person would think the other way around. You know, you probably say that, oh a flower pot is greater than a teapot, yeah. But the clay was really uh, uh, great, you know, and sandy, right? So it allows you to form uh, big items, right? And um, yeah, see, you know, Si Xiang Gan Chun is something that you see in the Cultural Revolution period. You know, most of the people just uh, didn't want to uh, put too much uh, sentiment anymore. You know, any of these historical sentiments or feelings, they, they, they used uh, the best clays itself, you know, into making all sorts of things from pots to flower pots and all that, yeah. And um, during the uh, early 70s itself, right, they started having, you know, uh, increased trade with uh, uh, China and, and, not China, uh, with uh, USA and and uh, Japan, right? And then uh, in 1972 itself, the US president, Richard Nixon, actually uh, visited China. And during this uh, cultural revolution period itself, right, you would um, uh, realize uh, there is one, one, uh, period of time in this history, about 1975, right, where red clay was becoming quite scarce. That means that when they try to um, dig, or when they try to dig through the stratas, you know, the, they, they, they couldn't find much red clay anymore, right? So, um, because of this uh, shortage of red clay, they decided to ration the red clay, and uh, I'll, I'll explain that later, right? But I'm just going to show you that this is um, one of the... Uh, adaptations of teapots that um the factory one did you know uh change in design to accommodate um the the request or the functional performance in in japan where they're brewing sencha so uh for huge pots itself they would make a kind of like a beehive filter and do take note that the beehive filter is always made from red clay right the body can be tsusa but so far all the filters that go on inside the big pots in terms of high filters, they are all made from red clay, right? So this is something that you may want to pay attention to if you are collecting, right? That's because red clay itself, uh, the the material is finer, allows you to make um, uh, more uniform uh, uh, kind of like a pores as compared to coarse uh, purple clay, yeah. So uh, just now I said, you know, that uh, 1975, right, red clay was actually becoming scarce. So uh, that also led to another birth of a new way of um, uh, producing red colored pots, right? So during the uh, end of the Cultural Revolution, there was a huge increase in what we call the Nei Zi Wai Hong, which means that it's actually a purple clay pot, but then to make it look red, they actually dip it into uh, a red clay as a coating. So with that itself, right, the amount of red clay you save like maybe about 30, 40 times of, 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 of material. Right, so uh, you can have a production of um, uh, red-looking pots, but inside is purple clay. Right, so this uh, you call Nei Wai Hong, right, and this uh, pot itself, the volume is very huge, very, very huge. You know, this, this uh, Southeast Asia itself, well, there are just so many of them, right. So, uh, but one thing to take note is that Nei Wai Hong doesn't mean it's not good, right. I mean, if you were to use a uh, Nei Wai Hong pot and you try to raise the patina, right, uh, the color is always very nice. You know, the color development on Nei Wai Hong pots are always very nice. That's because of the uh, expansion properties of Zi Sa, right? And the red clay on the surface, you know, in picking picking up all this um, uh, weathering and all this uh, tea, 
T um uh, oils and all that. So uh do take note that Nixie Wai Hong, good for raising patina. Right, this is something that we did see during the end of the Cultural Revolution, and then the making of uh Nixie Wai Hong pots stretch for very long. You know, it probably lasted maybe ten years or more. So into the eighties, into factory two, you know, they did make um Nixie Wai Hong pots as well. Right, just to conserve the red clay. Right, and then for the more premium ones, some of them they have called Neng Wai Ling Hong, which means that outside they drench with red clay, inside they also drench with red clay. So it looks uh generally red all around, but then it's it's purple clay in the core. Yeah. So this was just a, a historical events that uh had to happen so that um they didn't have to uh uh stop making red colored pots because of the lack of red clay. Yeah, there's also the blending of uh, Qing Shui Ni, which is uh, the purple clay. They added red clay, blended in to change the color, make it reddish. So this is uh, also uh, happened during the Cultural Revolution. Right? This, uh, uh, you can also find on the market. Right? Quite a nice, uh, uh, beautiful uh, texture as well. Right, and of course, uh, in the 70s itself, Taiwan started having you know, more and more interest in uh, Tzu Sa Hu. And of course, uh, uh, Tzu Sa Tea Pots itself, uh, you know, Ch Taiwan and China relationships are w were never good, right? So, uh, what that happened is that uh, in order to bring Taiwan pots into, pots into um, th Taiwan itself, right? They actually had to uh, grind off the base seal, so that you actually you eliminate this uh, the origin of the uh, pot itself. Yeah, so you can see that uh, in terms of uh, flower pots, you know, huge tea pots, all these, whatever they had to go to Taiwan in the early days, they actually ground ground the the, the Zhongguo Yixing uh, off so that it would, would allow uh, easy uh, import right they even affix stickers like you know, strange stickers like you know they, they will be made in Thailand or something like that so these are still being seen uh, sometimes on the market yeah in order to raise the production volume during uh, the cultural revolution period itself right in the uh, I mean early 70s itself they started moving from uh, the downdraft kiln itself into um, firing with a continuous tunnel Tunnel uh, firing, so pots will just uh, go in one side and come out on the other side as a finished goods, right? So this is a uh, uh, fired with a uh, heavy oil, uh, fired with a uh, kind of like a, a petroleum uh, gas based uh, uh, firing method itself, right? So um, the the firing in this itself is actually quite a consistent temperature, right? So most of the time, if you see uh, pots during this. Through this firing method itself, right, the firing actually is quite, 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 quite decent. Now, this is just an example of the uh, tunnel firing uh, kiln, right, and they call it zhong yu sao la, so use heavy, heavy, heavy oil uh, firing. You see also blackening, you know, all that. Right, and then, um, and, and of course, uh, in, in order to kind of like uh, enhance the, the export element, you know, towards the 978 or so, where, where uh, China started opening out itself, Right, uh, in order to enhance our overseas export itself, right, there was kind of like a reversion of uh, instead of using Zhongguo Yixing, because Zhongguo itself would probably face a lot of uh, trade barriers and embargoes and all that. So I decided to actually uh, change the seal back to uh, using the six character seals so that there is no uh, obvious origin. And uh, that would let, lead to the six characters itself having this, uh, you know, Jing Xi Hui Meng Cheng all coming back again. But all these seal scripts itself, as you can see, is what we call Luan Zi Zhang, which means that all the seals, the characters are very scribbly and all that. So I think uh, Prof Lu in, 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 in Taiwan, he has actually initiated a collection of all the Luan Zi Zhang, right? So he asked anybody who has this cute uh, Xi Shi Hu from, 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 from uh, Nei Zi Wai Hong, you know, uh, from the uh, early, uh, I mean, N70s or early 80s. And you can find that there's just so many unique uh, six character seals that came from this period just to uh, allow the easy export, right? So they also had uh, uh, started to allow uh, artisans to have a lot more personal ownership. So you can see that their names of the artisans are coming back onto the pots. So do take note, cultural revolution-wise, uh, they, they, most of the base seal is Zhongguo Yixing. Maybe in the lead, they let you put your an, an, uh, initial uh, a name or something like that. But then uh, towards the, the, the end of cultural revolution and then uh, to the uh, channel opening up, <coughs> They started allowing uh, uh personal you know uh, seals to be added uh, as the main seal on the pot. Right, so uh most of these uh, name seals itself are uh, all exported to Taiwan because they don't have the Zhongguo word there. 
<coughs> and of course during this um, period itself, there are two iconic plays that you can always um consider collecting if you're interested. Right. Uh uh in the in the end seventies to early eighties itself, uh there are two types of clay. One is the Nengao Tu, which is a brownish, very fine material that was being um uh mined in that, that the period of time. They make very nice um pots. Right. The other material that is uh, uh iconic to this era is we call the hazing to or called black star clay, which means that uh, in the Zisa clay you can find lots of little black uh specks inside. Right, this clay itself is also very beautiful. Uh, it, it forms the patina very very quickly. Right, so this um uh, period itself, you know, these are the iconic clays you should look out for, and um, if you look out of this era itself, you don't find this material. Right, if you say you have a hazing tool from 60s, no such thing, right? You say Nengal tool from 60s, no such thing, right? This is actually iconic to an era. So, so when you collect itself, always go back to the same fundamental, right? When you see the material, can you um, associate with the era or the period where it was being made? Yeah, and uh, these are some of the packaging. So these are 70s uh, kind of packaging, right? Uh, probably probably uh, early 70s, and 60s, early 70s packaging itself. They have made in China on the box, right? Uh, wrapped in paper and all that. This is a uh, small, medium, and large uh, original boxes, right? And then um, towards the uh new new uh era, which is the the opening out of China from nineteen seventy eight onwards, they started moving away from using made in China boxes because this is affecting the export. So they started using generic boxes like this. Right, and then uh, some of them even like say to to export to Hong Kong or to Taiwan, they use uh, carton boxes like this, and then uh, this Fang Yuan box itself, right, only existed after nineteen eighty one. Right, that's because uh, this Fang Yuan logo here, this upside down here, but this Fang Yuan logo was actually uh, registered in China in nineteen eighty one, so you don't expect uh, a huge factory right to use a mark, or a brand of a pot before registration. Right, it's not a Chinese way of doing things, you know. Uh, in terms of the kind of uh, um, cultural background, the uh, or national background they came from, so um, do do take note of that, right? So, uh, for export wise, right, they started uh using a lot of more generic boxes itself to ensure that you don't have any uh trade trade complications, right? So uh, one of the ways that uh they made it was to make it modular, right? The pot was being potted, you know, or was being packed. The, the pot is being packed, you know, in, in a generic box. It doesn't have any China words here. Just say Jing Xi Hui Meng Cheng Zi. It's a Luan Zi Zhang. But then, they affix the Made in China sticker on the side of the pot, which allows the importer, right, or the buyer to decide whether, you know, to have it on or off. Right, so this was one of the ways they used to, uh, kind of like a, uh, bypass the origin. Right, so uh, this is just uh, some photos I think I took from someone, you know, uh, uh, this uh, 1981, they registered the Fang Yuan brand, so the Fang Yuan box was also a, 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 an, an interesting box to look out for in collecting. Right, so um, the main China sticker, the oval one, right, was being used uh, from 1978 to 85, right, which means that you can have a teapot that comes in the Fang Yuan box, but it doesn't mean you use the Fang Yuan label. They will still use the, the round label. Uh, the Fang Yun label, right, we call the Pai Piao, right, was only being used between 86 to 90. And from 1990s onwards, right, they started using laser laser, laser label. All right, so these are some of the interesting stickers. But don't go crazy over this because I know some collectors who have uh, new old stocks of these labels. So any pot they want to sell, right, they can just uh, throw on the label and then, you know, uh, it becomes a uh, different price range. Yeah, so so there, there are still people who have some of these labels. Right, you can see, yeah, this is from a friend, yeah. Right, so just giving an example here, right, this is a, a pot that came from a Fang Yuan box, which means that this, this uh, but it uses the green label, right, so once you see this box and this label itself, right, that will mean that this pot is probably after 81, right, just a simple, you know, if you want to go down to that detail, lah. but this is just also uh, partly in the history of China, how they try to uh, circumvent or go around uh, import-export uh, issues, right, <clears throat> and I think I'm reaching towards the end already, so I think uh, in the in the uh Deng Xiaoping era, which is the 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 uh, end seventies to early eighties itself, uh, they allow a lot more of the uh artistic expression of the art the artisans and the craftsmen in in the factory, so they allowed them to do a lot of um 
redesign a lot of clay color blending and all that so in the uh, uh, early 80s itself this is when we call Bai Hua Qi Fang that means that you know all the artisans had a chance to express their own pent up design uh, you know they've been inhibited for so long so it's such a it's a liberation for them to express themselves so in, in just a period, short period of time right they came up with so many beautiful designs and materials you know so uh, I would say the golden era, I mean, in Factory 1, one of the golden eras is also the early 80s, where you see the uh, resurgence of uh, uh, design and and the uh, release from inhibition. So what you see here is what we call the Si Hu. This is a, a collection of 10 pots from 10 different materials itself. Um, they were being uh, produced all the way from green label all the way until white label. So um, you can still find some of these pots uh, in loose pieces on the market. But uh, you to find it as a set itself, the cost is not low. I think the last time someone quoted me somewhere around uh, two thousand dollars maybe for for a set of ten, which I didn't buy. So because uh, yeah, but I mean if you're interested, you can always um uh, keep a lookout for this. Right and um, as uh, the Yixing pots became you know uh, more and more exported itself, the market started you know um uh, picking up um uh Yixing pots, in order to cope right. So they started um, uh, kind of like a an unofficial factory two la, you know, just just at the site of factory one, right? They created another fa- another factory itself, mostly to take care of all the uh Southeast Asia and uh Hong Kong orders itself. So uh, in the early days of this uh, factory two itself, they typically uh, most probably would have used some of factory one uh molds, but in the later part uh they actually uh made their own molds and own designs la. Right, and based on the future demand of uh, uh wares itself, uh later on, you know, factory three, four and five were being produced. I think three four three and four were mostly making flower pots and five were making uh quite refined uh teapots. So after Kaika Kai Fang, you know, which is the the early eighties itself, you can see that there's a huge revamp to the um uh I would say repertoire of um, what Yixing factory one can produce. <coughs> So many different unique shapes and so many unique uh, artistic um, designs. And all these are mold dependent productions made from a mold. So that uh, if you were to, to find pots uh, from this catalogue itself, all the same pots from this catalogue <coughs> would have um, typically almost the identical um, uh, shape, angles and lines and all that. So these are something that you have to uh, uh, take note of, right? Uh, there is no uh, hand making of these uh, individual pots. Not so much of that. I'll say very rare. There are only I'll say a very small handful of handmade uh, premium items. That's because of custom orders or some high level gifting. Yeah. So I think uh, that that's all. And then um. I hope it's a, a good summary. And one of the most alluring, uh, alluring things about uh, collecting Zisa pots is that you can raise what we call the patina. Apart from it being good in brewing tea itself, right, is that overuse, it becomes more and more beautiful. And that's because um, in, in, in the Yixing material itself, we call it a dual porosity, which means that uh, the grains itself have its own innate porosity. But in between the grains, there's another degree of porosity. So um, the kind of dual porosity has a certain effect on 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 tea itself, and also at the same time, how the patina is being raised, and the the beauty of um the patina formation is one of the most attractive things in using, uh, enjoying eating tea pots. So so if you don't raise your own patina, you are not enjoying, uh, uh the pot hobby as much you know as others. Yeah. So this is just an example, of a pot you know uh, uh over here which I raised the patina. Right, and then this is just uh, before raising it. Right, this is a difficult process. 230 ml. You guess how many liters of tea you have to drink to get it up to the, uh, uh I mean, the, the current uh, patina. Yeah. Yeah, so you can see it's beautiful. Right, it becomes uh, almost.